Hi everyone, I'm Ellen. Welcome to a very special Broccoli Rising where I am delighted to introduce you to Annabelle Tomacic. She is an award-winning food writer and author of the brand new memoir, The Mango Tree. Annabelle is based in Florida like I am, but she is on Florida's West Coast in Fort Myers, which is about 160 miles from here. It's an easy drive, um, but it's a whole other world. It's quieter and smaller, but as I learned from reading Annabelle's book, not necessarily saner. Oh. The Mango Tree is subtitled A Memoir of Fruit, Florida, and Felony. So um, she had me at the title. Uh, mango is so sexy and juicy and, and messy. It's the world's most tempting fruit, and Florida was the first state to cultivate it. So yay us. Uh, we take mangoes very passionately here. How passionately? Well, um, a neighbor was stealing Annabelle's mother's mangoes, and she did the sensible thing. She shot him with a BB gun. Um, but that's just the hook. Uh, there is a whole lot of other incidents from Annabelle's past that come together for a great account, a fearless account, of her mixed race family's struggle to fit into a largely white community. Much to unpack, but first, welcome, 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 Annabelle, and congratulations. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Thank you so much for having me. And yeah, thank you for all the kind words. It's always so interesting to hear, you know, everyone's how people synthesize the book. And you did an amazing job. So thank you so much. Well, yeah. it's an amazing book, and it was not quite what I expected of being a food writer and you being a food writer. I thought food memoir, but it's really more than that. Um, yeah, yeah. It's funny because I think when I first started writing it, I was, I was, it started as a cookbook, actually. I'm not sure if you knew that, but um, uh, I was a food writer, I think about 15 years in at the news press and Naples Daily News at that point, and I was in a bit of a career rut. Um, and I was thinking like, well, what else can I do beyond, you know, restaurant reviews and these things that I'm doing every day for the paper? And I was like, oh, well, let's, let's write a cookbook. Like that seems logical as a food writer. And, um, the very like first versions of this, um, you know, after the incident with my mother and the BB gun, um, if you Googled mango shooter, you got my, my newspaper's story of my mother's you know, incident. And then the very next link was an absolute vodka cocktail for a mango shooter, which was less a cocktail and more just like do a shot of vodka and eat a piece of mango. And I was like, well, here's my problem. And here apparently is the solution to my problem. Um, and so for years, that kind of just stuck with me of like, you know, this would be a really funny way to kind of process all of this in like a cookbook with different essays and things. Um, and I, I got a proposal together for that. And it, it really wasn't clicking in my head. It wasn't clicking with agents. Um, and a good friend of mine was like, you know what you need to, she's like, I love the recipes, save them for some time later. But if you can get rid of those and just figure out how to connect these stories, you have a much more meaningful book that people will understand better. Um, and I was like, so what, so it's not a cookbook. She's like, no, it's a memoir. And I was like, I'm sorry, what? I'm not, I'm not writing a memoir. I'm, I'm a food writer. You know, I'm a journalist. Like, this is not what I was thinking in my head. Um, but the moment I, I figured that out and the moment the mango tree kind of clicked as this metaphor, you know, um, the symbol for all the chaos and, you know, beauty of, of our, my childhood and adulthood and everything. It was like, oh, well, this actually makes a lot of sense. And there's actually a, a pretty powerful story here. Um, so it was an interesting, an interesting transition kind of away from food a little bit and more towards, you know, the, the dynamics of family and, um, you know, mixed race childhood in Robert E. Lee County, Florida, and, you know, those kinds of things um, became, I think, a little juicier, if you will. <laughs> Absolutely. Um... For those of you who don't know, um, Annabelle and I are Substack sisters. You can catch her um, Substack newsletter. It's The Half Philip. Yeah. Um, yeah. So much about your book is about being a half in the wrong place at the wrong time. It's 
a lot about identity and trying to fit in. So yeah. now, as more or less a grown up, how do you identify? I'm like, am I a grown up? <laughs> like, when does that when does that start? <laughs> yeah, I'm in my forties now. I guess I guess I have to at some point. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> like, <laughs> can you repeat the question? <laughs> I got okay. caught. In all um, part. <laughs> how do you identify? Um, because oh, you yeah. were very clear about being half Filipino, half. American was your right. father Yugoslavian was that right yeah my dad's side is um Yugoslavian and English Canadian um my grand my grandmother was from Newfoundland Canada his my grandfather on his side was um, from the old Yugoslavia but I, I'm not sure which part um because you know it was pre uh everything you know Serbia Montenegro every, everything breaking off and forming their own countries um so yeah I, I think I think I, I've come to embrace much more my Filipino-ness as I've gotten older, um, just because I, I think I was so ashamed of it for years because it was not the norm, you know? Um, and now it's almost like I'm ashamed of my my shamefulness. And so I'm I'm trying to like course correct a little bit and be like, listen, like, you know, all of these things my mother did were for a reason. And um, there's actually like really, you know, delicious traditions and, and um, you know, healthy connections that can be forged with food and culture and identity um, when you start embracing these things and not kind of shying away from them. Um, and, you know, in the last, honestly, since my mother's, since the the trial and everything with her shooting, um, I've, I've gotten to know my Filipino family a lot better. Um, we went back with the kids, with my kids in 2022 and, um, it was fantastic. Like it, it was lovely to kind of not only feel that connection for myself, but see that connection for them kind of be forged of like, oh, this is this is where we're from. And, you know, at least part of us is from. Um, and this is, you know, one of those roots that made us who we are. Uh, and yeah, I, I think I've been trying a lot harder to connect with that Filipino Americanness just just because I, I was so hesitant when I was younger to, you know, to embrace that. Well, you hit on something I was going to ask about later, but now's the time. Yeah. Uh, tell me uh, the difference as you see it between a Filipino and an American food sensibility. Oh, wow. Um, that's actually, I mean, it's a really deep question when you start thinking about it. Um, you know, just thinking my grandparents' generation, you know, my mother was born in 1951, which was six years after the Japanese occupation of the Philippines ended. Um, and prior to that, it was American occupation. Prior to that, it was Spanish occupation. So there's a long history of colonization um, in the Philippines. And in that in one way, it has brought these really, really rich foodways through, um, you know, like our takes on adobo and our takes on Pancit and the influences from China and the influences from Spain are, you know, I think it's honestly one of the most under-recognized food, you know, cultures perhaps in the world. Um, but at the same time, the sensibility, like the idea of food, just, you know, with my grandparents, I mean, the Japanese occupation was brutal. There, there was no food. So, you know, you, you created food from what you could. Mm -hmm. um, and that sense of deprivation, I think, filters into the next generation, you know, where my mother grew up very, very poor, better than, you know, she was doing better than her parents were. Um, the, you know, the Japanese occupation was gone, Philippine independence had sort of happened. Um, but it, it was, you know, it was the idea of, you know, you, 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 there's not much and you make the absolute most of whatever you have. Um, and yeah, you valued food in a way that I really wish we could get Americans to understand when we waste up to half our food in this country, that is not sustainable. Yes, yes, we did not come from a wasteful household. We came from a household where every bit and every bite was eaten. And, you know, I think my mom coming here was, was there was kind of this two-sided coin because on one side you had this abundance and you had this availability of everything. But then on the other side, she wanted to make the most of all of that abundance, you know, and I, I think that kind of towards the end of the book definitely led to her hoarding um, and the idea that she didn't want to let go of anything because she grew up with so little. 
Um, but then, you know, the fact that we were growing, I mean, green beans, we were, we were growing green beans in our yard, which I was just at a friend's house and they were picking their green beans. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is a flashback to my childhood right now because it's green bean season in Florida. And, um, you know, it was like, to me, again, as a kid, it was just embarrassing. I was like, you buy your food at Publix. You don't pick your food out of the yard, mom. Like, this is so embarrassing. Um, but we grew, you know, green beans, tomatoes pepper plants. I mean, she had all of her different fruit trees and stuff, which that was more of a, a summer thing. Um, but ampalaya, which are these uh, like bitter melons, Filipino bitter bitter melons. Um, we grew a lot of stuff in our yard um, because of that sense of like, you, you never know when food will be available. So, you know, if you can have it, if you can grow it yourself, then that's food security, which is something she did not grow up with as a child. Um, so yeah, it, it's a very, very different sensibility. And then you know, as as times have changed and as wealth has poured into the Philippines, I feel like it's almost you know, it, there's so much there's so much availability now, but there's still this deprivation mindset, which is why like type two diabetes is running out of control, and you know, mm -hmm. obesity is a problem there as much as it, as it is here, um, and it's it's just interesting to see how those you know, how various different countries facing different pressures. Kind of move into this this modern day of of you know food abundance but yeah i mean i could talk about that for that's a whole different book maybe <laughs> oh, me too yeah yeah um so um is there a particular food that tastes like home to you whether that's filipino or i know you were a caterer for a while so yeah. like what is it like yeah. when you know when you when you come home and it's like ah is there something that's like that for you yeah, I do think, I mean, I think it's adobo. We we ate adobo a lot, which, you know, in the Philippines, adobo is uh, really any kind of, it's it's a meaty dish for the most part, although there's a beautiful mushroom adobo that um, mm -hmm. uh, Bettina Magdalintal of Eater. Oh, sure, I know her. A, a, a phenomenal recipe that I've made in the past that is, it is so good. But um, the, the, the crux of adobo are uh, vinegar and black pepper and garlic, which mm -hmm. you put anything with vinegar, black pepper and garlic, and it's going to be delicious. Um, and so just that smell, and it, it's a very quick, you know, so it's something you can throw together on a Tuesday night, you know, after the kids have been at school all day or you've been at work all day or whatever. So that, that was a go-to in our house if, um, you know, when my mom was, was, was cooking, um, which she, she cooked most nights or we were eating, you know, leftovers or whatnot, but, um, yeah, there's something about, there's a, it's a very distinct smell and a very distinct flavor profile that just kind of sinks me back into like, okay, well, like everything's all right if there's adobo happening tonight, you know? So, yeah. So tell me about um, cooking. There's a, a rather poignant scene in your book where your mother tells you, hey, I need you to step up. You're what, like 12 years old? Yeah. And um, so, yeah, you're you're cooking for your yourself and your younger sister. Was that the start of it for you? Did you learn more when you were in the Philippines? Were you professionally trained? I will let you answer. Yeah, um, very little professional training, no, um, but it, it was, it was at home um, and it was just, you know, I was the oldest daughter of three children uh, and, you know, our father died, which is a, a big story point in the book, um, when I was mm -hmm. nine um, and uh, not to give too, too much away, but we, we almost, moved uh to the philippines actually when i was 12 um and i you know begged my mother like not even begged like i i threatened her basically um you know saying like i can't i can't go there like we we have to stay here this is where my my 12 year old life is like it was impossible for me to fathom anything you know different um and she said well you have to help then like you have to not sleep in on the weekends and need to start making stuff for your siblings and you need to start helping out more around the house and I was like, whatever you need, because I'm not, I can't, I can't go live over there. I just, it just felt so impossible at the time. Um, and yeah, I start, I started, I mean, I was cooking a little bit before then, because, you know, you're a kid and you're trying to figure things out, but that was definitely when um, kind of more of it fell to me, you know, and, and, you know, lessons in peeling potatoes and lessons in snapping green beans and lessons in um, all the things we, I, I had to do. Um and I, I don't think I loved it back then because it just felt like more work, you know. Um, but then, you know, I, I went to school and uh, I was on this medical school track forever. Um, and 
I, you know, ended up not going, I ended up getting rejected from like the couple of medical schools that I applied to. And I took that as a sign that, you know, I didn't get into the University of Hawaii. So I'm clearly not meant to be a doctor. Um, and I traveled a little bit and I read a couple of Anthony Bourdain books and I was like, oh, like food sounds like so much fun. Like, it just sounds like such a, you know, so just like something that interests me and it sounds, you know, intriguing to me versus, you know, organic chemistry formulas and anatomy classes and, you know, lab work and things like that. Um, and so I started working at a little Mexican restaurant here in Fort Myers. Um, my mom was not very happy about that. <laughs> that was a tough conversation to tell her I was not going to go to medical school. And instead I was going to be a line cook at Iguanamia. Um, but I loved it. Like I, I loved kind of the, the mindlessness of it in a way where you, you know, you don't have to think you just have to do because, nice. you know, there's diners coming in and there's X number of orders that are pouring in and they have to get out in a certain time or else everything gets messed up. Um, and I, I really, really enjoyed it. I, I loved working with food. I loved the camaraderie of the kitchen. I loved, you know, like you don't, it's not just about you. It's about not letting the people around you down. Like you, you may just be doing salads that day, or you may just be plating or expediting or on the fry station or whatever, but it's all part of this, you know, kind of bigger picture that has to work in order for things to go. Um, and I think that's, that's where I fell in love with restaurants for sure. It was just like, it, you know, you, we didn't grow up going to a lot of restaurants because it just wasn't, you know, what my mother did. It's not where she spent her money, um, whatever money she had. <laughs> um, but, and so I became very fascinated with this idea of like, oh, like people come here for an escape and you can offer that to them through food. Um, and uh, I, I worked in uh, a couple of different kitchens. Um, and then I went over and worked for a catering company. And then they had a daytime um, cafe that also did like breakfast, lunch catering. And this was like in the mid two thousands. And at some point I got a big head and was like, Oh, I can do this. I can do this myself, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and it's, you know, it's Florida in the mid two thousands. So there's just money everywhere and everyone's building and, you know, mortgage brokers and title companies and doctor's offices, the rules for doctor's offices back then were different where you could, you know, the, the sales reps could bring food to ply them to buy their pharmaceuticals or whatever. Um, you know, so I was like, Oh, let's tap into this momentum. And um, I started a breakfast lunch catering company with a good friend of mine. Um, and it was, it was a lot of fun, but we were, we did not make any money. <laughs> like we just lost mm -hmm. a significant amount of money <laughs> in, that, in that endeavor. Maybe not significant, but we, we lost money in that endeavor. Um, but it led to my, it led to my job at the news press. Uh, yeah. So we, we were doing breakfast, lunch catering and needed a night job. And a friend of mine was like, well, the news press is hiring a sports writer at nighttime to take like calls and stuff. And I was like, I, I just need it to be at nighttime and I need it to pay money. So, um, you know, it's funny how all these little very random decisions, you know, became catalysts for this book. So, yeah, yeah you, you have an unusual uh, career trajectory that way from med yeah. student to caterer to um, sports writer, to food writer, to memoirist. Um, yeah. <laughs> and uh, speaking as someone who has no sports gene whatsoever, <laughs> how does sports writing and food writing, how how do you go from one to the other? I mean, I think writing in general, and I think when you figure this out, you're like, oh, well, that's, you know, it's all just storytelling, right? Like, at its core, it's all just a, a story that you're telling of, you know, if it's a game or if it's an athlete or if it's a chef or if it's a restaurant, you know, like it's people's stories at the end of the day. Um, and I, I think when I figured that out, like, cause it, when I got into sports, I was like, I was just like a clerk. I wasn't writing at first. I was just taking calls and I would like compile and God bless 2005, like the, the local RV parks would call in with their shuffleboard scores. And I would take them down and put them into little, you know, a little format and it would run, you know, with the hole in ones from the country clubs. And then, you know, we'd get the, um, the horse racing results from, you know, uh, from East coast and things like that, uh, where the big tracks are and stuff. And that was my job was just to collate these and put them on the back page of the sports section. Um, and then like slowly they kind of like, were like, well, you're here, like, let's just give you a couple stories and see how it goes. And I was 
terrified because I was like, oh, you know, I don't know. You know, I was like Googling, like, what is PAT like in football? And it's like <laughs> point after touchdown. And I was like, oh, I had no idea what that was. Um, so I was really just kind of faking it. <laughs> um, and uh, I remember one day, one of the sports editors saying like, because it was like award season and you had to like, you know, submit all these stories for awards. And they asked me if I wanted to submit anything. And I was like, no, <laughs> like, I don't even know what I'm writing about, you know? And they're like, he's like, my goal is to get you an APSE award by next year. And it was Associated, you know, Associated Press Sports Editors Award. Um, and he's like, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna work on this. And I was like, oh God, ooh, like, you know, um, and then, I mean, I, but the beauty of it at that time is that I had so many mentors and so many people like willing to kind of say like, why is your sentence this long? Like this sentence doesn't need to be this long. And, you know, you need an active voice here instead of passive voice. And you need to give us more details. Um, and the, the other beauty of journalism is you write every single day, multiple times a day. Um, so there's a million opportunities to make mistakes and to learn from those mistakes and then to make better mistakes and learn from those mistakes. Um, I think I won my first APSC award. Like, like it was, you know, we stuck to that plan. And I, I think I won like an honorable mention the next year and then, you know, things got better and better. Um, and then, you know, when it clicked that it's not like, it's not that you have to know all the statistics and you have to know all the stuff. You just need to figure out what the story is. You know, like there was, I think one of the first, the first times that I got like a little gold star or whatever, um, it was a high school softball team and they were like in the playoffs and um, they were down like three runs and they all had their little rally caps on, you know, where you turn the hat upside down to like motivate the team to do better. And um, it was like a, a private Christian school and they went into their dugout and they said a little prayer and then they went out and they scored like four runs. And they ended up winning. And so the lead to my story was like, you know, the evangelical Christian school girls softball team at the bottom of the eighth, you know, went into their dugout and said a prayer and somebody was listening. And um, my editor was like, this is a story. <laughs> like, this is the story. He's like, you figured it out. That was the story. You know, it wasn't the fact that, you know, you don't leave with like, they won nine to eight, you know, like you lead with like the the good stuff, like the stuff that you want to tell people about. And like once that clicked, I was like, oh, you just need to tell people the story. <laughs> like that became like true of everything of like not just sports, but food. And, um, you know, even with like recipes and things like that, it's like, you know, you can just give someone a recipe or you can spend like just a little bit of extra time and like give them the story behind it and a little bit of context to it, you know, and yeah, that that's what good. I think makes food really delicious when you get the backstory. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, well, storytelling, you are, um, you tell some <laughs> tough and true stories about your own family. Um, how have they reacted to the memoir? I know you saw your mother this morning, so you're obviously still speaking here. to you. Yeah, she's here right now, actually. She's in the other room. <laughs> um, yeah, right. <laughs> Um, they have, uh, my sister and brother have both been wonderful. Um, I was honestly kind of most worried about my sister. Um, mm -hmm. she and I had, had very different childhoods. Um, I'm four years older than her. And, um, you know, I, I think there's a, there's a big difference, you know, if you have a mentally ill mother and a father who passes, um, of like, I mean, I, I had nine years of like, at least having two parents, you know, even if they weren't the most stable parents, and even if they, they fought a lot, I had nine years of like relative stability. Um, and then, you know, like my sister didn't have that. My sister and my mother have a very estranged relationship. Mm -hmm. And my worry was that my sister would think I took it too easy on our mom. Um, and so like, she was the person that I was like, you know, if she's okay with this book, then I will be okay with this book. Um, and so, you know, she, she was very honest. She's like, you know what, this is the story that you needed to write of our childhood. And I was like, thank you. Like, yeah, I think that was like the, the best we were going to do. Um, my mother in a very sad turn of events has vascular dementia right now. Um, yes. Um, so I don't think she still thinks it's a cookbook most days. Um, she struggles with like processes and like, um, you know, like uh, sequences and things like that. So I, I don't know that she'll ever read the book, um, which is a weird blessing slash curse, I think. Um, but 
I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what she think. I'm, <laughs> I've like racked my brain trying to think like, you know, what would she think? Um, I mean, I think it's a very honest book, but I think ultimately it's, it's a very, I don't know, redemptive, you know, I like, I think a big part of becoming this grown up that I maybe, maybe am, or maybe I'm not, <laughs> is that um, I kind of learned to see my mother like for her whole picture and not just for these singular incidents that, you know, as a kid stick in your mind um, or as the child of anybody kind of stick in your mind with your parents. Um, so I, I hope that, you know, I, I think what I was maybe most surprised by is that everyone's like, you know, you, you show so much empathy towards your mother. And I was like, do I, <laughs> you know, um, I, do. Um, I, I hope I do, but you know, yeah. Yeah. Um, let's talk mangoes. It is um getting on to mango season and all the trees in my neighborhood are crazy mad with blooms. So I am okay. hoping for a really good season come summer. Um what's your gut reaction to mangoes now? <laughs> <laughs> what they have been in your past. I know, right? I still love them. <laughs> I still, I still like you know, that first, like, really juicy, like, when it's still warm, you know, mango, when you just pull it off the tree, like, I, I still relish that moment, but, um, yeah, well, I still get nervous. My mom still has, she lost the main mango tree that was, like, you know, the, the central story of the book. That one um, came down in Hurricane Irma, so in 2017, um, and that felt kind of like a sign from God of, like, okay. clearly she was not meant to, right, have these mango trees, um, or this particular mango tree, uh, but she still has, I was just, I just posted about it on my Instagram, like, she still has 13 mango trees, like, all around her, and she doesn't have, like, a, like, a palatial, you know, it's just, like, a quarter acre lot in, like, suburban Florida, um, but she has all these mango trees, and I, I forget until it's this season, and you see the blooms coming out, I was like, oh my gosh, that's a mango tree back there, too, I just thought it was, I don't know, a tree, um, so yeah, I, I get a little bit nervous still, you know, like I said, with, with her dementia, I don't think she's, she also cannot own firearms anymore, which is, a, you know, a fun byproduct of being, <laughs> it is probably, let's be honest, again, for the better. Um, yeah, I also, just to know, like, uh, nobody was hurt. She actually, she technically shot at him and missed. So um, no one was was physically hurt, but she ended up shooting out their rear the rear window of his truck. Um, but yeah, for for many years we would all get just kind of like nervous, you know, of like and kind of check in and be like, where is mom at right now? Like, what kind of mental state is she in right now? Um, you know, should we be? We try, you know, we tried to like fence off her yard, but with the easements and stuff, like it just didn't work. Um, so we just kind of put up a bunch of no press, no trespassing signs and like crossed our fingers every summer. Um, but there's definitely an anxiety that, that comes. Um, yeah. And, but I, I still love them. I still like, yeah, I, I found actually, and, um, I forgot that she had a, uh, she had like a freezer in her garage. Um, and we had to get rid of most of her food because she was staying with me during the last hurricane, during Hurricane Ian, which absolutely, you know, decimated this coast. Um, so she was living with me for like three weeks because our power came back on very quickly, but hers was out forever. Um, and so we had to get rid of, you know, all the food in her fridge and everything. And I forgot that she had like a deep freezer in the garage um, and I was going through it and like we had to clean it out. But I found so many mangoes in there, but they were all kind of melted and like, you know, like juicy and glassy looking and I was like oh they're not good anymore but um but yeah last summer she had zero mangoes which I think the trees were just you know traumatized from the storm um and this summer or this you know spring her blooms look really really good so I'm hoping that we'll have good mangoes again but yeah <laughs> you are a mom now and I think your daughter is 12 or just about and age that was kind of pivotal for you how yeah. do you see um your 12 year old self in her and you know your relationship with your mother echoing through your relationship with your daughter yeah wild yeah, yeah. um do you have kids do you have children no I just lost our dog um oh so, but that's where right. we are yeah. right now yeah, yeah it, it is 
it is the weirdest little mirror to yourself in your life, you know? Um, and it's funny because she's very fair skinned and she has kind of like dirty blonde hair, but she has my features. So I always say she's like the white version of me. <laughs> like, <Yeah. you> know? <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, there's so much, you know, and I, I think especially when I first became a mother, so I have a 13 year old son and a 10 year old daughter. Um, and when I first had them, um, I was very like, I was, I was parenting very much like in, in reaction to how my mother did, you know? So I was trying to like, I was overcorrecting again, you know, where I was trying to be super, super, you know, um, involved and supportive and, you know, emotionally connected, which are all good things. Like not, not that this is, these are bad things. Um, but then I, I think like with age, I've started to like, you know, like I don't need to dismiss every single thing my mom did. I don't need to, you know, like, like there are little nuggets in there that I don't need to be ashamed of holding on to, you know, when it comes to even just like setting boundaries with them and enforcing those boundaries. And, um, you know, like I'm not here to be their friend. I'm here to be their mother, which was, you know, my mother was never our friend, you know? So, um, I've, I've found myself kind of like, especially through the, just the process of writing this book of just being like, okay, like we don't need to shut down every single thing she did. Um, mm -hmm. There are, there are good things in there. Um, and, you know, it doesn't mean I'm becoming her just because, you know, I'm setting strict boundaries or I'm, you know, enforcing chores or whatever it is. Um, it, it, there's room for both, you know, there's room for, there's room for understanding and all the aspects of, of, her parenthood that I'm now trying to navigate <laughs> with with these children but yeah yeah I do think I mean I think a big thing that we lost with our mom was trust you know like like we didn't trust her and she didn't trust and she never trusted us which was a, an issue you know like she never and I was a great kid <laughs> there's yeah. like so many times where I'm like I was such a good kid and I just I never earned her trust um, and so a big conversation in my household with my children is about trust, you know, and like, if you can earn our trust and if, by doing what you're saying you're going to do and being where you say you're going to be, then you get more freedom, you know, you, you get more leeway to go make your own decisions because then we can trust that they're going to be good decisions. Um, and I think that's the one thing. And my husband, I mean, and this is touched on a little bit in the book, you know, he came from also a very kind of uh, fractured household. Um, and so I think for both of us, that has been a big thing is like, we want our kids to trust us like more than anything. We want them to trust us and to feel like they can come, come to us when they have questions or things are, you know, not going right or whatever. Um, cause that wasn't an option when I was a kid, you know, like if you wanted to go to somebody, you went to a friend or you went to, you know, and thankfully I, ha I had really good friends around. I think things could have gone, it could be a much, much different memoir if I had, you know, if I didn't have good friends around me, but yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it is an amazing memoir, and I was supposed to do this before. Did I screen share? Oh, this yeah. is the book. It is fabulous. A memoir of fruit, Florida, and felony, the mango tree. Uh, it is going to be out April what? April 2nd, Tuesday. But you can start ordering it now. Yeah. Um, Yes. And I will actually, I will be in Miami April 7th at Books and Books in Coral Gables. Oh, how I fantastic. I will be there. Yeah. Yeah. I would love to see you. I'm like, everybody come. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for having me, Alan. This has been such a delight. It's been a delight for me too. And guys, I will send you the link. I will show you everything. Um, and if you're in Miami, come see Annabelle on April 7th. Of the books and books and coral gables. <laughs> it's the place to be. Thank you, everyone. See you next time.